just started the recording, Kevin. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. I'm going to share my screen now. Can everyone see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. So again, this is inclusive writing for health sciences professionals. This is a, a, a an icebreaker conversation a lecture on uh, inclusive writing practices, best practices. So we have three um, goals for today's session. First is to define the meaning and purpose of inclusive language. The second is to understand best practices for writing about topics such as race and ethnicity, sex and gender, sexual orientation, and disability. And the third goal is to know how to apply inclusive writing best practices in, in a medical and health sciences context, since, of course, we are a <clears throat> health sciences uh, university or college. So definitions. What is inclusive language? Inclusive language is defined as language that avoids the use of certain expressions or words that might be considered to exclude particular groups of people. Inclusive language is a subset of cultural humility. The term cultural humility, humility was first coined by Melanie Trevelyan, a healthcare consultant and public speaker, and Jan Marie Garcia, a clinical professor of nursing at the University of California, Davis. Their article on the subject, titled Cultural Humility versus Cultural Competence, a critical distinction in defining physician training outcomes in multicultural education, first appeared in the Journal of Healthcare for the Poor and Underserved back in 1998. Cultural humility entails three aspects, a lifelong process of commitment to self-reflection and analysis, attention to power imbalances in the relationship between the physician and the patient, and developing mutually beneficial and non-paternalistic partnerships with communities that aim for systemic change. Inclusive languages, language acknowledges diversity, conveys respect to all people, is sensitive to differences, and promotes equitable opportunities. This refers to language used in emails, marketing material, social media, websites, and various other forms of communication. All of your work should be free from words, phrases, or tones that demean, insult, or exclude people based on their membership within a certain group or because of a particular attribute they may have. Language is fluid. Now, the meaning and con connotations of words can change rapidly. It is more important to apply inclusive language principles rather than learning specific appropriate phrases as these can change in meaning over, over time. Do your best, we all make mistakes. Understanding the basic principles of inclusive writing will help. Remember the number one rule. If a person specifies an aspect of their identity, such as their sexuality, race, or gender, use that identification. So inclusive writing, how do you start this process? Uh, from the patient record on up to a journal publication draft, constructions commonly start with the phrase people or people living with. People living with a depression, not depressed people. People diagnosed with cancer, not cancer patients. People with asthma, not asthmatics. People who use wheelchairs, not wheelchair bound people. Older people, not the elderly. Young people, not the youth. People experiencing homelessness, not homeless people. People with low income, not low income people. So there are three parts to general guidelines and then I'll launch into specific aspects of inclusive writing, including of course, um, most importantly for us in, in the medical community is health sciences aspects of inclusive writing. So uh, the first section in, in general guidelines, look for ways to include, portray, and integrate equity and inclusion in diverse populations into stories, written materials, websites, and all other communications. 
Don't use offensive and derogatory terms, including such terms derived from the identity of a specific group, such as Indian giver, gypped, or Jude. Outdated terms such as crippled, or overly clinical or medicalized terminology such as homosexual. If you are uncertain of whether a term is derogatory, seek appropriate input. Now I have double asterisk this because I have a reference section uh, at the end of the PowerPoint here uh, that uh, lists different organizations and, and um, uh, that will help you with that. And so the double asterisk here will link you to, and I'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes, the AMA's guide uh, for inclusive language. Also, be aware of terminology that refuse to identify that refers to attributes or identities such as race, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, disability, religion, age, or immigration or veteran status. These can uh, adversely overemphasize an identity. They can feed into stereotypes or be discriminatory. So consider context. What is, for example, would you include a particular characteristic or identity? for any particular group. What is being accomplished by noting the characteristic or identity of someone? Would you use the term black professor or heterosexual musician in this specific context in which you are writing? So part two of general guidelines, focus on the person, not the identity. It is, if it is relevant and important to distinguish elements of a person's identity, focus on the person. For example, a, pa a baby with Down syndrome, not a Down's baby, or a person living on a subsistence level income instead of Jane Doe is low income. Victim language should be avoided. This includes not just calling someone a victim, but also phrases such as afflicted with, struggles with, etc., lives with whatever issue it is, or has whatever issue is preferred. The one example that you see all the time, particularly in obituaries, the phrase battling with or fighting cancer implies victimhood or weakness. When possible, be as specific as you can to describe people. For example, Chinese rather than Asian, Guatemalan instead of Hispanic, lesbian or transgender rather than, than LGBTQIA. Remember, when in doubt, ask a person how they would like to be identified, which includes what pronouns they might prefer. Consult also with the appropriate style guide for the type of writing you are doing in order to determine how best to identify the proper names of nationalities, people, and races. So part three of general guidelines, make room for a person's complex identity and the complexity of different communities. For example, a veteran or a person who uses a wheelchair may also be part of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender communities. Muslims, Latinos, Jews, and others may be from many different races, ethnicities, or geographic origins. Be sure to weigh the use of general or specific terms when referencing places of worship, events, or holidays so as not to exclude any group or perspective, but be specific when the instance requires. For example, when discussing religious buildings or institutions generally, use a term such as a place of worship or house of prayer. If a religion is specified, use the particular terms such as mosque, synagogue, church, chapel, and so forth. When discussing the calendar or date ranges, reference the season of the year, for example, winter, rather than a specific holiday. If a religious holiday is specified, use the particular term, such as Christmas or Rosh Hashanah, and so forth. Okay, now I'm going to launch into specific categories of inclusive writing. We're going to start off with uh, race and ethnicity. And as I alluded to earlier, guidelines uh, for inclusive writing in this category, as well as the others that, that I'll be talking about, they will and do evolve to reflect cultural changes. And nowhere is this more true for language regarding uh, ethnicity, place of origin, and race. Don't mention race or ethnicity unless there's a concrete reason for doing so, and make sure that reason is clear. Race or ethnicity may, in fact, be relevant when discussing certain health screening recommendations or, or conditions. Race refers to a category of humankind that shares certain distinctive physical traits. Ethnicity 
refers to groups of people classed according to common racial, national, tribal, religious, linguistic, or cultural origins or backgrounds. Because these terms are cultural constructs that can have biological implications, you should explain how people you discuss are classified regarding race, ethnicity, or both. You should also explain who define these classifications. In other words, has it been predetermined by a researcher or self-reported by the participant? and also why they were assessed so. Be sensitive to the designations that individuals or groups prefer. For example, some people prefer being classified as black rather than Af African-American or vice versa. Also, be aware of how these preferences may change over time. Not everyone in a group will agree with the classification. In fact, I mean, there's certainly a level of, of uh, dispute and disagreement and perhaps sometimes controversy regarding these these specific terms but again as long as you're following the general guidelines you should be fine okay uh the category of sex and gender make your content that you're writing as general neutral as far as possible in general word your content to avoid masculine and feminine pronouns he or she instead use you where appropriate and sometimes they uh, when you need a gender neutral, neutral pronoun, unless this happens to be you know, lending to some confusion. Gender is often confused with sex, but these terms describe two very different things. Sex refers to the biological characteristics of males, females, and intersex persons. However, gender is a spectrum. It's a cultural indicator of a person's per personal and social identity, so it's important to mark those distinctions between sex and gender. Consider how specific in the context you're writing you need to be. In other words, specify sex when it is relevant only. In research, you want to report and define sex or gender and how you assessed it. Outside of research, however, choose sex-neutral terms that avoid bias. Opt for people more often than men or women. You might refer to people with a cervix or people with a prostate gland. Why? It's a consideration for non-binary and transgender folks who also need these types of health services. Trans, transgendered individuals give birth, for instance. So avoid, as an example, the disease threatens mankind. For a preferred, the disease threatens humankind. All right, the topic of sexual orientation. Only indicate sexual orientation in your writing when it is scientifically or medically relevant. When referring to spe specific groups, the terms lesbians and gay men are preferred to homosexuals. Also, avoid using gay or gays as a noun. You may, however, use heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, asexual, and intersex as adjectives. In other words, heterosexual noun. Avoid, the researcher collected surveys from homosexuals. To the preferred, the researcher collected surveys from lesbians and gay men. Again, specificity is where you want to go with this. Personal pronouns. Uh, a lot has been said about that. We've had, we've had uh, group events here uh, where we've given out pronoun uh, tags for, for, for folks uh, in the atrium. So I know most of us have been exposed to this to some degree. Uh, in terms of writing, you want to avoid sex-specific pronouns unless they're irrelevant. Avoid using common <clears throat> and gender pro pronouns. Replace he and his with he or she or his or her. A citizen is allowed to vote in the primary if he has registered in advance becomes with inclusive writing. A citizen is allowed to vote in the primary if he or she has registered in advance. Note, he or she is much better is a much better alternative to the one we've seen often where you've got an S um, slash H E for she, he. <clears throat> this is an alternative, this latter, the S slash he, he, H E, is an alternative that you should try to avoid. Um, pluralize a sentence and make all cases plural. That's also helpful. An example here is an effective teacher will have good presentation skills to market himself and his ideas versus or becomes effective teachers will have good presentation skills to market themselves and their ideas. I know we've done this 
um, in cases of, of traditional understandings and, and aspects of, of a two-gendered system, male or female, uh, where we don't know the gender. So um, that should not be a familiar, uh, familiar um, aspect or way of writing to us. Avoid the physician and his resident perform the surgery and, and write the physician and their resident perform the surgery. And better is to say the physician and resident perform the surgery, avoiding personal pronouns altogether. Now on to the category of age. Uh, you all only include age if it's relevant. Um, for example, with vaccinations, screening or testing programs for particular age groups. Uh, cliches and adages like you can't teach an old no, new, tr new tricks and senior moment. These uh, phrases and cliches play into stereotypes that older people are unhealthy or in mental decline. Avoid these and similar turns of phrases. Ageism is discrimination based on age, and this can be young or old who are discriminated against. Avoid using terms that imply a stereotype and seniors, elderly, and the aged. And in research studies, always state specific ages or age groups. This way you avoid entirely uh, that uh, discriminatory language. So avoid, the study compared the effects of the drug on elderly patients and swap that with, the study compared the effects of the drug on patients 65 years and older. There's no judgments there. Here's another example. Avoid the physician measured BMI in young children. Uh, and swap that out with the physician measured BMI in children between two and six years old. The next category is socioeconomic status. Labelism, labeling is a form of bias or stereotyping. Avoid labeling people with their socioeconomic status. Rather than use terms like the poor or the unemployed, use low income or no income. For uh, Another example here would be... Uh, the homeless versus persons or people experiencing homelessness. Another example, we determine mortality rates in the poor uh, to we determine mortality rates in persons from low income households. All right, moving on more specifically to the medical health sciences aspects uh, of individuals and inclusive writing examples. Persons with diseases, disorders, or disabilities. The general rule is to avoid <clears throat> labeling people when talking about disabilities and conditions. We use positive language. Some disability activists and groups prefer identity first language, in other words, disabled people, as opposed to person first language, people with disabilities. Always follow a person's or group's self-identification where this is available to you. When you cannot ask them or it's unknown, default to first-person language. Some examples of this uh, particular labeling include diabetics, schizophrenics, and epileptics. Don't describe a person as handicapped. Instead, describe the disability. Avoid the patient as a diabetic to the preferred the patient has diabetes. And you'll see this uh, in... Uh, resident reports and in rounds where you're describing from the medical record, the patient is a diabetic. So getting in the habit of, of writing at all levels, not just for, for publication purposes, but at the, but at the health record uh, and, and uh, clinical level, patient, uh, physician level, always practice writing uh, however or wherever um, you are experiencing or working with. Uh, this category of individuals. Now, labeling can also occur in a more subtle form. Some researchers run into trouble when describing patients with a particular condition, such as breast cancer. They'll describe the patient by using the condition in an ad adjectival form, breast cancer patient. This phrasing can be okay when used enough times uh, to create an awkward type of a text, but it is not preferred. So another example here is the study assessed COVID-19 patients to the preferred, the study assessed patients with COVID-19. You see the subtle difference there. You also want to avoid describing persons as victims 
I'd mentioned that earlier, or other emotionally loaded terms that suggest helplessness, such as afflicted with or suffering from. Avoid the patient suffered from a myocardial infarction, and stay, say instead the patient had a myocardial infarction. Be matter of fact, and you will avoid um, you will avoid um, offense. Also, avoid euphemistic descriptors such as physically challenged, special, or special needs. Now, of course, particularly special needs, you see that everywhere. But if you try to be as specific as possible, you will avoid those. You will be able to avoid those phrases. Okay, that is essentially the end of my lecture, but I do want to point out some guides that I have uh, uh, included in the presentation here, and that's why the advantage of having this recorded also is that you'll have the ability to, to go back and to, and to um, consult these resources. resources. For the general talk section here, I have uh, references, Conscious Style Guide, Diversity Style Guide, The Language of Inclusion, a progressive style guide and the radical copy editor. These will all help you with your general uh, writing uh, in an inclusive style and format. For race and ethnicity language, uh, these there are several resources I've included here. Asian American Journalists Association, National Association of Black Journalists, National Association of Hispanic Journalists, Cultural Competence, Native American Journalist Association, Tribal Nations Media Guide, and, and then our very own Office of Diversity and Community Relations here at PCOM. For the um, category of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer terminology, I've got a couple references. Uh, the Association of LGBTQ, Journalist Style Book, and the GLAD Media Reference Guide. Now for disability language, we're getting more specific with medical and health sciences. Uh, the AMA Association, excuse me, sorry about that, I skipped over. Um, the AMA's uh, Advancing Health Equity, a Guide to Language, Narrative, and Concepts. And double asterisk down below, the AMA Health Equity Guide, which is a PDF format. I'm going to try to um, see if I can jump right to there to the actual website so here is the pdf and it's downloadable format uh, again I, you know this is going to be a fabulous you know consider this as as the bible of, of equity and inclusion in medical writing this is a fabulous resource um, it's got health equity language sections why narratives matter glossary of key terms um, it's just a wealth of information it's over 50 pages so I think we have someone who has a question. Go ahead and unmute. Um, since, I, since I'm doing the presentation, I can't easily jump back and forth. Um, or we could address it later. I, mean, I have a Q&A coming up, and we'll take a look at that. It's, it's from Barbara Myers, Kevin, and she'd like you to send her the slides with the references to share with her team. Oh, all right. Did, Barbara, did you include uh, your email address? No, um, I did not, but I will. I'll add that. Okay, well. all right. We will, we will jump to that during the Q&A, which is coming up in your seconds. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let's see if I can get back to my PowerPoint. Uh, below the AMA Health Equity Guide is the National Center on Disability and Journalism. And, as promised... Uh, I've got a Q&A, so I'm going to stop um, sharing my screen at this point, and we'll um, get into the Q&A here. Okay, Barbara, I've got your email address there. Thank you. So, uh, comments and, and or questions. I hope this was helpful to everybody. This was helpful. This is Chandra talking. Um, I'd like to have a copy of the slides as well, if they're available. Oh, sure. Okay, could you pop your um, email address into the uh, chat? Certainly. <laughs> Thank okay. you. I wonder, I wonder if I can print that. Maybe. 
be. Yeah. I've got the addresses for you, Kevin. Oh, oh, great. Thank you, Barbara. Uh huh. <laughs> How many attendees did we have today? There have been 11 people attending today. Great. All right. Uh, any other comments or questions or observations? Again, I think the takeaway here is, is for us to do our best. Everybody makes mistakes. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the language is evolving, of course, and will continue it to evolve as language in our culture evolves. Uh, the important thing is, is to understand the basic principles and do your best. Um, I think in terms of health sciences writing, that AMA guide is like phenomenal. Kevin, um, this is Barbara, I'll, Barbara Myers. I'll just make one quick comment. Um, you know, we're always trying to, as a journalist, we're, we try to minimize words. And, you know, and with this, it, it's sort of like you have to use more words to get your point across in order to not be offensive, I believe. So, um, you know, instead of using something as an adjective, it's it's more a noun. It but, can um, be, but it's like learning anything. You know, a new process. Uh, the more you the more you use the new process, the easier it becomes. Um, and there are, I mean, it's not limitless in terms of, you know, groups and 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 populations to describe. Uh, once you've gotten the hang of it. Uh, you should be able to to uh, walk into it a little bit easier as, as you go. But yes, it's anything new uh, does require some some adjustment. Uh, and it's again, it's not like we haven't done some aspects of this. Say, for instance, that example I gave where uh, an individual's gender is not known. So we automatically do use they and there. Um, that's just one example, but yes. Um, very, very helpful. Thank you very much. I mm -hmm. appreciate it. Mm -hmm. uh, Catherine, I think you raised your hand. I, I did. Um, I have a comment and also, well, there are two comments actually. Um, I've always had a great deal of difficulty with the notion of using the word they or their when we're talking about a singular individual. And I appreciated your ability to, you know, get around that. If we're talking about large groups of people, of course, saying they are there makes sense. But when we don't know the gender of an individual. So I like the fact that you said he or she. Um, mm -hmm. I see um, younger people using they and their all the time, even if they're referring to a singular individual. And yeah the nuns would have flipped out, <laughs> let me just say. Well, I, you when know, I, I do think... I was trained. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, without, yeah. without trying to launch into ageism, I mean, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not ultra sensitive on that aspect. You see, I have gray hair, so that, that automatically means that I'm not, you know, a 30 and under individual. It, uh, you know, I admit that it, it may well be more challenging you know, if you've come from uh, another um, style of learning. Uh, you okay, know, so it, I graduated, you know, full disclosure, I graduated from high school in <laughs> 1970, okay? Oh, okay, I graduated yeah. in 78. Uh, but so, uh, yeah, it, Catholic it nuns, Catholic Preparatory Academy <laughs> in New York, they would be flipping out with this discussion but i understand that we need to have it but that's that's this is that was my editorial comment but the real reason sure. i got on was i wanted to call everyone's attention to the december 30th new england journal of medicine there's an excellent article uh under the under the topic of perspective and um I, I would call everyone's attention to this because this physician group, these two doctors, Dr. Alan Brent and Christopher Goodman, make the case for why we should no longer include race or ethnicity at the beginning of a clinical case presentation. The reason I feel this is so important is an old dinosaur like me has always felt that we should say the patient's age sex and uh, 
ethnicity because it would give us important clinical information about the patient. And this article absolutely debunks it. And it's the first time that I ever actually said, you know what, I hate to say it, but they're right. So I just call your attention to this article. Uh, it might be something you would like to take a look at. That's all. Well, thank you, Catherine. That's excellent. You know, another example that I'm thinking of is um, like sickle cell disease. I think... That's well, actually one of the things that the authors mention in the article. Yeah, and I, and I think that, well, certainly all of us involved in healthcare, whether it's education or in any context whatsoever, I think 99.99% of us know that that's an African-American um, um, situation or, or illness or 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 what have you, or condition and such. So in, in that context, is it necessary to write, you know, the patient is an African-American with sickle cell disease? It's kind of an oxymoron in a way. Um, so, but yeah, what did the article say about sickle cell? I think the point there is if you say, if you know the patient has sickle cell disease, then you would say that. But if you don't know that, then knowing the age and ethnicity of the patient might make the light bulb go off. The way I was trained by rheumatologists was we looked at the gender and the decade of life to help give us clues about what rheumatological disease an individual might mm. be having. So I'm, I am an, I am a dinosaur. I, I admit that I, I have struggled with this moving away from giving what I considered obvious data. If I walk into the room and the patient is black, why wouldn't I say that it's a black woman, you know, an older black patient or older black female? If I can, I cannot, if I see that, you know, yeah. why is that a wrong thing? And I understand now that the political implicate, the correct cultural um, approach to this but I have to say it's been difficult for members of my generation. It um, has. And I do worry that there may be some richness of understanding um, as a writer and a clinician and a keen observer. Um, I think I, I, the, part of me still says, hmm, really? All right, and I'm going to shut up now. Because this is my opinion, and I'm, I'm putting it out there as my own opinion. And that's why I think this article in the New England Journal uh, was very useful, because it yeah. does help me to flesh out my feelings about this. Sure. And I mean, if, if I'll, I'll take that a step further. The example that I'm thinking of here, uh, and it's hotly debated, uh, Black, uh, uh, as a racial descriptor, is a capital B white is a small w and the reasoning for that is this i didn't invent it white is not a shared identity it's not a shared set of experiences whereas black is but i think i don't entirely agree with that because you have black folks from continental africa who are recent immigrants you also have blacks who are descendants uh, of slaves in this country. I think the cultural experiences are very different within those. Now, also in terms of the small w of white, um, if you include ethnicities within that, such as, for instance, Anglo-Saxon, German, that subset of white people, they do have common cultural shared experiences you know, in, in, in nationhood, if you will, in some cases. So, you know, I, I I wonder if that will evolve and change with time and the small W turns to a capital W or if people, when they're asked to describe their ethnicities, uh, you know, on, on survey forms or on intake forms, don't check other and put German or Anglo-Saxon because they don't like that small W for white. I'm just saying, you know. Yeah. And we I, still ask that question when we're doing research, like when we're doing a survey, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we, we might put, you know, Caucasian. Yeah. Or, so, you black, know, this, this, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's evolving. There's it questions. Is. There's not a little controversy with some of this. Yeah. Uh, some of it's common sense. 
Um, but it, you know, it's continually evolving. That AMA guide, if you if you check next year, you, you can be sure that portions of will be have will have been yep. revised. <laughs> I agree. Thanks as, so you know, much. As, you're welcome. As long as you understand the principle, basic principle, and why we're worried or concerned or we want to do this, then I think you're on good ground. Okay. Thanks. This has been great. Um, I'm sure this uh, we'll be re revisiting this at some point. Um, I'm volunteering my, volunteering my services as a speaker. If you have any sessions or what have you uh, that you might want to talk about this, I'm, I'm more than willing to to, uh, to 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 add some of this to to that. All right, everybody, have a great day, and thank you for attending. Thank you. Stay well. Thank um, you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.